Praise God. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, watching this message. I hope that it finds you well and that you are blessed. Uh, today I'm going to teach on the last days, the last days or the last times. Um, and again, I think this is a very timely message because of the world where it is at the moment. Many people are talking about the last days and the end of the world and the last times. Um, and I'd like to take you to what the scriptures say, what the word says about this. Um, as you've heard me say before, it is very important that we look at the context in the word. So it is true that the Bible is written for us um, and the word of God is alive and sharp and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Um, and that that word is alive, it is for us, it speaks to us. That word planted in our hearts and upon our lips that we speak has power to transform us from the inside out and to change circumstances around us. So the word is for us, it is for all generations. But there are particular things in the Bible that are for specific people, generations, specific times. And they are written to a particular audience. Um, and they are written about specific events as well. So it's important that we understand the historical context of, of the word and then we take it into account when we read through the word. Um, if we do this, we will really be set free from a lot of bondage and funny doctrines that are out there that bring a lot of fear to people. So um, it's important that we read the word with the history books and that we look at the historical records and quite often we will see that many things have been fulfilled as to what was written has been fulfilled in terms of historical records that we can go back and we can go and see. Um, so that's very important for us to understand. Um, and this particular message on the last days really I think is one of them. So I want to go into the scriptures. I want to ask you a question first. The last days, do we think that it is the last days are still to come. Do we believe that we are currently in the last days at the moment right now? Or do we believe that the last days were in the past and that they are fulfilled? Um, so what I intend to show you in this short session is that the last days have been fulfilled. They were talking about a particular time in history and a particular event that took place. Um, but I want to go through the scriptures and show you this as to what the word says. The first one I'm going to go into is Hebrews, Hebrews 1. So we're going to go to Hebrews 1 verse 1 and 2 that says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so you see there in verse 2, it says that God has spoken to us in these last days by his Son. Okay, so when was Jesus Christ manifested on the earth? When did the Word become flesh? Uh, when was he in a, in a human body on the earth? When did God speak to him on, or speak through him to us on the earth? It was 2,000 years ago. Um, so that's the first reference to when the last days actually were. 1 Peter 1 verse 20. Um, I'm actually going to read from, from verse 17 onwards. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Okay, again, there's another reference. Uh, verse 20, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. Again, when was Jesus manifested? When was he in the flesh? 2,000 years ago. Another reference as to when the last times were. Hebrews 9, verses 26. 
Hebrews 9 verse 26. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. Verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay, so there it says, he, he has now once at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That word ages there, the Greek word is eon, A-E-O-N, and that means age or it means period of time. So that scripture is saying that at the end of a particular period of time, Jesus appeared to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. What was that particular time? That particular time was the old covenant. It was the law covenant. It was the covenant that was governed by the Jewish system, the, the rules and regulations and laws and traditions that everybody had to try and keep. We know that they could never keep all of the laws. That is why the law was given, so that people could see that they could never ever accomplish and fulfill the law. It was too much for them and that they needed a savior who would come, and that is Jesus. So that is the purpose of the law. The law is not for us to keep. It is not for us to try and keep the law. The law is to show us that we cannot keep the law and that we need a Savior who's paid the price and fulfilled the law for us and, and given us mercy and grace through his finished work. Hallelujah. So that was the end of the ages. It was the end of that law Jewish age, which came in AD 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was completely destroyed by fire, that was the end of the second world. Um, Jesus fulfilled the law when his body was nailed to the cross. Colossians tells us about how that happened and what he did. Um, and that he made a public spectacle of, of the law and of the enemy. And he nailed, he fulfilled the law to the cross in his body. So that's what he did on the cross. But the fulfillment, the complete destruction and removal of that law system happened one generation later, 40 years later, when AD 70, um, sorry, when Jerusalem was destroyed, rather, in AD 70. And that was the complete removal of that old law system, the old covenant. Um, and that is the age, the eon, that particular age at that time. Amen. Let's go through to Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, verses 17. This is now just a bit of context. Is um, Peter and the disciples have been filled with the Holy Spirit. They have received power from on high, as Jesus promised. They were waiting in Jerusalem. They were waiting in the upper room at Pentecost. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They came out and, they, and Peter, with great boldness, preached to the crowd that was there. Um, and he shared the message of the gospel. He shared the good news of the gospel with the people that were there. And the Bible says that 3,000 people came to the Lord. They were, they were saved. They were born again that day. They were, added, they were added to the church. The church actually began from that moment after the Holy Spirit was poured out. But this Acts chapter 2 verse, verse 17 tells about the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in Joel chapter 2. Verse 28, he writes about, I will pour out my spirit. And he prophesies what God says about the, about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. What Peter says in Acts chapter 2 is that that particular time when he was speaking there in Acts 2 was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. So Acts 2 verse 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood 
before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so note the beginning there in verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit. And that, Peter is saying, was just fulfilled when he was speaking to that crowd 2,000 years ago. Okay, um, right, let's move on to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk about in James chapter 5 now is the last days that he, he mentions in James 5, the last days. Um, but he also talks about the coming of the Lord. So let's just read. James 5 verse 1 is a rebuke against um, against the rich, against those who have who have kind of highly esteemed their riches and their wealth, um, and they've placed what they've done and their earnings and their achievements in high regard. So James 5 verse 1 reads, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. So again, he's speaking to those particular people. I'm not saying that there's no relevance to us today. There is, but that particular reference there is you've heaped up treasure in the last days. Um, and then let's skip forward to verses 7 to 8. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Okay, so what you see there is it refers to the coming of the Lord. That coming of the Lord, um, also written about in Matthew 24, is all part of the first coming of Jesus. So this is not the second coming of Jesus. I do believe in the second coming of Jesus, as I've mentioned in previous teachings. Um, the second coming of Jesus, he will not come for sins. He's already come to pay the price for sins. But the Bible says in Hebrews that he will come to bring us to full salvation in the second coming. Um, and we will also receive renewed bodies, um, and all of those awesome things. But that coming of the Lord there refers to the first coming. So that is part of the first coming. Jesus came, he went to the cross, he paid the price on the cross, he, he died, he was buried, he was resurrected, and he ascended into heaven, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. And then in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. All of that was part of of the first coming. So that coming of the Lord that it's talking about there is the judgment on the old covenant. It is the judgment on the old law system, the old Jewish system, um, which was being removed in AD 70. It was completely destroyed and removed. And that was the coming of the Lord. It was the judgment against that old system. And the old has passed, the new has come. There was a brand new covenant that Jesus brought. It came into pass. It was properly instituted after AD 70 when the old was completely removed out of the way. So that is the coming of the Lord, um, the first coming of the Lord. Okay, um, just to read. I'm just going to read for you now out of, let me just see where I am. 1 Peter 4 is the next scripture I want to go to. 1 Peter 4, just to mention quickly on that James 5, 7 to 8, the Amplified speaks about the coming of the Lord is near. So that New King James Version, the coming of the Lord is at hand. The Amplified Version says the coming of the Lord is near. Okay, so this was written 2,000 years ago. At hand, near does not mean now 2,000 years later. It was near at that time. So this was written that book of James there was written in the period between the crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So it was written in that period. And that's why he says the coming of the Lord was, is near. It is at hand. It was to come um, within a few years from when this was written. 1 Peter 4 verse 7 is kind of a 
a confirmation of what I've just been talking about. 1 Peter 4 verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Again, the end of all things is at hand. That is not talking about all things, everything now in the whole world. That's talking about the end of that Jewish system, the old law system. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Okay. Let's go to 1 John 2. 1 John 2 verses 17. 1 John 2 verses 17. I'm going to read 17 and 18. And the world is passing away. That world there is not, is not the cosmos. That's not the entire world. That is, that is the world as in referring to that age, that eon that I was talking about just now. So sometimes it's referred to as age, sometimes it's referred to as the world. Um, and, that, and that is what that world is, is in, in 1 John 2.17. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that, that, that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. I'm going to read the Amplified of that, 1 John 2.17. And the world passes away and disappears. Passes away and disappears. That's what happened in AD 70. The old Jewish system, the law system, passed away and disappeared. And the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Oh, sorry, I've just read the wrong version there. Let me start that again. Amplified, uh, 1 John 2.17. And the world passes away and disappears, and with it the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides, remains forever. Boys, lads, it is the last time, hour, the end of this age. And as you have heard that the Antichrist... He who will oppose Christ in the guise of Christ is coming. Even now many antichrists have arisen, which confirms our belief that it is the final, the end time. So he's saying there that the fact that these antichrists have risen up confirms their belief at that time because they understood what that meant, that it was the final, the end time. How did they understand that that was the end time, that the many antichrists rising up was a sign of the end times? Well, it was a confirmation and it was the fulfillment of what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. So in Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Okay, so that was prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24, that the false Christ would rise up. 1 John there talks about it. Um that that was the confirmation. When the Antichrists rose up, that was the confirmation of their belief that it is the final, the end time. That was a sign of the end time for them. Not the end time of the world, the end time of that old Jewish system, the law system. Amen. Speaking of Matthew 24, um, let's go to verse 3 of Matthew 24. That's the next scripture. Verse 3, Matthew 24. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I know it is three questions there. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So there's three questions there, but we're focusing on a couple of them now. Um, so we're talking about the sign of the coming. I've spoken about the coming and judgment against that old law system. Um, and the end of that age was the same thing. It was the end of that Jewish age, that law system. Um, and then if we look a bit further on in Matthew 24 and verse 34, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, not, not the generation we're in now, that generation he was speaking to there on the Mount of Olives, 2,000 years ago, that generation will by no means pass away 
till all these things take place. Please note that is in Matthew 24, verse 34. He's already listed all of the things, the, the wars and the rumors of wars and the earthquakes and the, and the tribulations and all the things. He's listed all of those things, the famines, the pestilences, all of that took place during that generation. And that generation then was a period of 40 years. In the Bible, if you go and look there, you'll see generation equals a 40-year period of time. So Jesus was saying that the generation he was speaking to would by no means all pass away. They would not pass away before all of the things that he spoke about in Matthew 24 would be fulfilled. Okay, it's not a future. Those are not future events. It was fulfilled during that time leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and in AD 70 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Everything completely fulfilled. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 11 reads, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Okay, so again, that was the ends of the ages. I'm just, I'm putting that verse in there just to give you context about the timeline as well. Um, and that speaks about the ends of the ages having come. 1 Corinthians 10. Okay, uh, one or two more scriptures to get through. I'm just going to read that same 1 Corinthians 10 first in the Amplified. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11. Now these things befell them by way of a figure. As an example and warning to us, they were written to admonish and fit us for right action by good instruction. We in whose days the ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, there it again just confirms for us. Um, it was in those days the ages had reached their climax, their consummation, and their concluding period. The concluding period of the law age. Okay. Hebrews 8 verses 12 to 13. Hebrews 8 verse 12 to, 13, 12 to 13 reads, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. I've put that scripture in there but just to confirm again the, the time period as to where this was. Because that was written, that Hebrews 8 verses 12 and 13 was written during the period between the crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That's why it says... Um, Jesus had made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So it hadn't completely vanished away yet because it was written before AD 70. But in AD 70, the old was completely, it was obsolete. It grew old and it vanished away completely. Amen. So now where are we now? Where does it leave us now? I think the whole idea behind this behind this teaching has been to talk about, yes, the last days, but also to talk about the three worlds. There were three worlds. The first world was the world that was destroyed by water. So that was the world where Noah and his family were the only, um, only people to have been preserved. The rest of the world was all destroyed by water in a worldwide flood. So that was the end of the first world. The second world was the law world. It was the world that was governed by um, the law and the principles and the rules and regulations and the Ten Commandments, but there was a whole lot more than just the Ten Main Commandments. Altogether, there were 600 and something commandments, um, basically impossible for man with a sin nature to keep all of those laws. It was just, it just could not be done. But that was that second world. And that second world was destroyed by fire. And that happened in AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple completely destroyed. Um, and that ended the second world. Then there is a third world. There is the world that we are in now at the moment. This is the current world we are in. Ephesians 3.21 confirms it. If you look in the King James Version, it reads, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, throughout all ages, world 
without end. Amen. So we are currently now in the world without end. We are now in the new heaven and the new earth. The old has passed away. Everything is new now in Christ Jesus. He has completely fulfilled it. When he said on the cross, it is finished, he left nothing undone. He completely fulfilled all of the law and all of the prophets in his finished work. His blood shed, his body broken, completed um, what God intended. Everything that was spoken about in the law and the prophets prior to that, previous to that, was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. Now we get to live and rest in his finished work. The church gets to rise up now to take that authority God has given us to, to proclaim what Jesus has done, what he has already fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And the church is going to increase as the rock in Daniel 2 came and destroyed and broke down the statue. And that same rock grew and grew and grew and covered the whole earth. That is what is going to happen. The church is going to rise up and the kingdom is going to increase on earth as it is in heaven. And it's going to increase, increase, increase. And, the, and this is the world without end. The world without end. And Jesus will come back to a victorious church. He will not come back to rescue or to rapture a defeated church. He will come back to a church that has ruled and reigned and the kingdom has increased. Um, because the knowledge of the glory of God must cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government or kingdom and peace, there will be no end. Okay, world without end, Ephesians 3.21, Isaiah 9 verse 7, Of the increase of his government, of his kingdom, there will be no end. It will increase and increase and increase uh, in Jesus' name. I hope that this message has blessed you. If it has, uh, please feel free to share this with, with other people that you may know, with friends. Uh, and also please subscribe to my channel if you have enjoyed this. Uh, and I will be sharing more teachings very soon. Thank you very much. Be blessed in abundance in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye-bye.